welcome. I know most of you. My class is just good to have you here. It's good to have all of you here. And I look forward to a good session here. It won't be a terribly long session, but it'll be a productive one as we talk about some aspects of it. And really, what I, I want you to approach this as a you can do this kind of encouragement, pep talk, however you want to see it. Because what can we do in 30, 40 minutes, really, to transform our writing? Well, I think what we can start to do is transform how we think about writing. And that's really what I want to challenge you to do today. Those of you who are in my classes, you know I try to do that. I try to uh, get you to think about what your thinking of writing is, and, and then to think, why do you think that way about writing? And because sometimes the way we think about something gets in the way of actually doing something. Notice that? If we have kind of the wrong mental construct or framework for approaching any kind of problem solving activity, if we don't think about it right, then we're going to get started in a completely wrong way. Writing is like that. As my students know, I, I talk about writing as a problem solving activity. It's complex. And from the time we first have pencils thrust into our little fists and we are taught how to write. We're taught ways of thinking about writing. We're taught academic ways of thinking about writing. Now I want to be really clear about what I'm going to say. Um, there is a place for what we call academic writing. And it's in academic settings, right? When you write about academic topics. And yet, the way I'm using that term, academic writing, you probably have gathered by now. Go on in probably gathered by now that I'm not using the term academic in an entirely positive way when I talk about academic writing. Okay? And so we're going to want to try to put our finger on what are some of those qualities of academic writing that maybe we are going to want to rethink and challenge and try to work out of our writing, even though we've had years of having them worked in. We've been saddled with a lot of negative attitudes and conceptions. Some of those are the do's and don'ts that we can easily list and talk about, right? But more than that, there are attitudes, ways we think about what the purpose of writing is. And so what happens is you sit down to write something, either with a pen in hand or with your laptop in front of you, and strange stuff comes out of your head, through your fingers, onto the screen. I mean, would you agree with me on that? Strange things, and what I mean by that, things you would never say. Why is it that things you would never say manage to go from here, through your fingers, onto the computer, or onto the page? How does that happen? It's like somebody else is speaking. Well, actually, you know what? Somebody else is speaking. You know, it's that textbook voice inside of you. Every bad textbook you've ever read, every model you've been given, every do and don't that you've been told about what writing is, and as you're writing, you're not thinking about what you really want to say as much as you're listening to that annoying voice that just won't stop telling you how to do this, how you should do this, and it ends up that you don't even know how to say what you want to say, and you forgot what you want to say in the first place. Because some other kind of voice, this academic voice, is taking over. I feel passionately about this. I love writing. I'm a writer. I've written several books. I, I, I love the process of writing. And so I kind of approach this with a, with a missionary zeal, as it were, because it's unfortunate that something as wonderful, as potentially exciting and adventurous as writing can be, and even as potentially heroic, and you'll see why I use that word, as writing can be, is turned into something so mundane, something so utterly boring, like a root canal. Well, root canal's not boring, but it's definitely not pleasurable, right? And so that's kind of where I'm coming from when I talk about academic writing. Here's how I want us to proceed for the next few moments. I want to take a somewhat abstract topic. And I want to use a metaphor that I think will be familiar to a lot of you, but I'm going to give you in a moment a handout that will give us a summary of this if it's not familiar to you. I'm going to use as a metaphor a story, an epic story, a heroic story, a story about a hero who killed monsters in fact, that was the title of this presentation, right? So I've got to tell you, I changed the title just a little bit, okay? Writers can do that, right? You get to the point where you're working on your, your paper, your, your talk, whatever, and you decide, no, nah, I don't think the title really describes it quite as much uh, the way I want it to anymore. So this is my new title. 
the writer as hero overcoming the monsters of academic writing. So it's still the same topic, right? But now I'm kind of casting you and me in a somewhat heroic role here. In fact, we're going to be heroes like Beowulf. And that's the story that I want to use as a kind of metaphor. How many of you, be honest, how many of you kind of remember, sort of, a little bit, vaguely in the back of the deep mists of, of ancient history, you kind of remember Beowulf was this assigned reading there, a couple of you of you, okay? Beowulf, come on in. Well, Beowulf is a great old English poem, okay? Written about a thousand years ago. Written in a, a form of English that nobody probably in here would be able to read if you were to see a line of it, because that's how much the language has changed in a thousand years. But it's a wonderful story. And if you haven't read the book, so to speak, maybe you saw the movie that came out a few years ago, I don't know. But it's a great story. I'm going to use it as a metaphor. I'm going to use it as a vehicle to talk about what I'm terming the monsters of academic growth. It turns out that Beowulf, and I mean, we're going to look at a little summary up here in a moment, that's going to be our way of kind of launching this and talking about some writing. Beowulf, does anybody remember how many monsters Beowulf had to kill? Had to fight? He killed three. Yeah. He killed Grendel, and then Grendel's mom got really upset at that, right? And she came hunting him. He had to kill Grendel's mom. And then 50 years later, he's an old man, and he has to fight again. This time he fights a, a dragon, a greedy dragon, who's guarding this treasure in a cave. Well, these are three monsters that Beowulf has to fight, and I want to use these three monsters to talk about academic writing. And we are going to, as I've retitled this, the hero, the writer as hero. We're going to see what we can, what we can find in Beowulf in these battles, so to speak, that he fights. It will give us some ideas about how we can approach writing in a way that's fresh and new and not bound by these monsters, right? Now, again, as I hand this sheet out, I want to mention to you something I say to all of my students in my classes, and those of you uh, will recognize that, and that is that whatever situation you're in that requires you to write, one of the principles I always try to teach, make sure you always follow what? What do I call it? House. Follow the house style, right? The house style is in this classroom, in this office, this is what you do and you don't do. You know what? If you're a smart student, you're going to start a smart employee, you follow the house style, okay? That's just a principle, right? But what I am presenting to you is a way of thinking about writing that's not going to be bound by house styles. It's not going to be bound by academic styles, is if you want to really develop your capacity to write and to write well, then these are some principles I want to give you that will help you to do that. And then, as I said, you find yourself in a setting where you're expected to write a certain way, obviously you do that, right? But hopefully, even in the limitations of that house style, you'll be able to write better if you apply these principles. Fair enough? All right. Three, four, five. So why don't you start this little This is a summary of Beowulf, okay? Two, three, four, five. There we go. So, I want us to start at the obvious place by reading this summary, which I labored over to write. It was hard for me to write, and you'll see why. You'll see why it was hard for me to write this, okay? But I'm going to ask you some questions about it. The questions that below, and I'll just read these questions while this is going around. How would you describe the writing style? Can you put your finger on what the author is trying, is doing to make it sound this way? And what are some things you could do to improve the paragraph? I'm killing two birds with one stone, right? What am I doing? I'm giving us the summary of Beowulf so we can talk about these three monsters, but I'm going to be illustrating something about writing. Okay? Let's, let's read the summary. Beowulf is an old English poem that relates the story of three epic battles. First, the killing of a monster, Grendel, was initiated by Beowulf. Having heard of the terrorizing by Grendel and the Danes, Beowulf undertook a long peregrination across the ocean with the intention of bringing assistance to King Hrothgar. The defeat of Grendel occurs in the Mead Hall at night and happens when his arm is torn off by Beowulf. Next, 
The Danes are attacked and revenged by Grendel's mother, who is pursued by Beowulf to, to her subaqueous lair and subsequently killed. In the process, Beowulf accrues great fame and is made king upon his return home. Finally, a last battle is fought between Beowulf and a dragon who is protecting treasure in a cave. Having become an old man and needing the help of a younger warrior, Beowulf nevertheless manages to defeat the dragon before expiring in the battle. The telling of the story of Beowulf and his three epic battles was common in England a thousand years ago, and it remains a popular story to this day. Now, I hesitate to do that, and I wrote that paragraph, because I don't like that writing at all. And it didn't come natural, because years and years and years I've struggled to write in a way that's much different from that. And yet, having said that, everything there is grammatical. Everything is there. I can guarantee you that everything is grammatical, and if it's not, please show me, because I'll be surprised. I've worked on that, and I think it's all correct. I think it all made sense. Maybe with a little turn of phrase here or a word there. Do you agree with me? You got the gist of the story of Beowulf, right? But did, did, did it work as writing? Talk to me about that. How would you describe the writing style? Cold. Cold. Very analytical. Very analytical. Okay. What are some other words? Bland. Bland. Like a book report. Like a book report. Like a bad book report. It's <laughs> It's forced. So but that's a way of saying it, it doesn't sound natural. And that's another way of saying it doesn't sound like if I were describing it to you in conversation, would I probably say it like that? Never. Never. Yeah. Any other words that you want to use to describe this? It's very factual. Very factual. Okay. Boring. Boring. It doesn't make you want to read this amazing story, does it? And it is an amazing story. Well, I mean, these are all great gut-level responses, and that's exactly what I wanted you guys to respond to. You wouldn't want to keep reading this. It is a kind of academic-sounding voice, because I tried to use particular academic conventions and to overuse academic conventions in the very worst possible way. I tried to make this sound like the worst textbook I possibly could. Okay? Now, the trick for us, if we're going to see that, well, you all recognized it. You have experience as readers of textbooks, okay? And, and you, you've read academic writing, and you know it's very different from, say, a John Green novel or something, right? And so the question is, why? Why is that? And I'm not saying that academic papers have to read like a John Green novel or something, no. But there is a quality of naturalness there, an economy of usage and directness of style that we should be striving for, but that is really seldom effectively taught to us as students. There are certain things that we need to put our finger on. And here's where I'm going to, my question's going to get a little more pointed. It was, I asked you a minute ago just to describe it and respond to it. You said it was cold and calculated and analytical and boring and bland. And, and that really hurt my feelings. That's what I was hoping you'd say. But I wrote it that way. But the question I'm asking you next is why? Can you, can you describe why it's that way? Can you point to specific things? Because if you can't do that, then you're not going to have the tools to avoid writing that way yourself. When you sit down to write and type, pen in hand, keyboard in front of you, what's going to happen? That textbook that you've read over and over and over again for all of your years, that's the voice you're going to be hearing because you know it's an academic assignment and something strange happens in your brain and suddenly you head into a different mode and you start producing writing like this. Okay? Unless you understand how to identify it and to recognize it and to change that. So, can we identify anything here that makes it sound like that? What do you say? Um, just like a list, like it says first, next, finally, and things like that. Mechanical, we might say, right? Mm -hmm. There's a kind of a listing quality that just seems mechanical. Um, do some of you do that in your papers? <laughs> yeah. Um, are we kind of taught to do that? I mean, yeah, when we write and, and we have a paper that maybe has a lot of points to it, and now there's a place for that. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying, right? There's a place for that. And the place is when things are complicated and you need to give a transition to your reader so they know where you are. You want them to follow you, right? It's important to do that. But 
isn't this kind of hitting me over the head? You think it's really that hard for me to follow that you know there are three monsters that you have to tell me first, second, and last? And tell them no. And so I agree. That's it's a very mechanical style. What else can you identify about the writing? Use big complicated words. Say. Yeah, so uh, what's the one that you would point to? Um, who was sued by, who was it, they moved to her sub, whatever, later. Yep. Ah, it's sub, it's sub yeah, I really had to reach down deep and find that one, okay? Because yeah, uh, what was the word, what do you think, what do you think would be the, the natural everyday word? Underwater. Under, underwater, actually, aqua is in that word, sub aqueous, right? So I was thinking, man, I want to bring some really big words in this and sound impressive and academic and so on, right? Because I'm, I'm writing an academic paper and I've got to use these multi-syllable words, right? Because that's what textbooks do. And so, somehow, it couldn't possibly be an ordinary underwater layer. It has to be a sub layer, right? Because it's a more official, I think. Any other words? Any other words like that? Peregrination. What on earth is a peregrination? Yeah, it's, it's a, you know, you're making a long journey that winds around like a pilgrimage or something. Yeah, but that's it. Yeah, he, he does make a trip across the ocean, but just call it a journey, call it a trip. There's no need to call it a peregrination, unless you're trying to impress people, right? And again, that's kind of the instinct we feel when we ride. Is anybody here guilty of that, right? Yeah, okay, we do that, don't we? All of us do, right? And it's one of those checks we have to put on our writing. And that's why you've got to develop, the biggest key to becoming a good writer is to develop the ability to read your own writing objectively. To read it ruthlessly, right? Because we love what we produce, right? And it's hard for us to see it accurately. What else? We've identified two good things. The mechanical nature, the big words that don't need to be big words. What else? Boy, there's some other really important things that you haven't pointed out yet. Some of the sentence structure. What about the sentence structure? Like uh, the killing of Grendel was initiated by Beowulf. Why can't you just say Beowulf killed Grendel? Do you notice that there's an indirect way of saying things, right? And what does that lead to? When you say something indirectly, confusion. it leads to confusion potentially, right? What else does it lead to in your writing? Wordiness. Wordiness. Where you're using 10 words, where maybe five words would do, right? It does something else. It can lead to confusion. It can produce wordiness, but what else can it do? It makes me tired of reading it. Okay, that's great. It makes you tired of reading it. Okay, you have to work harder at it, right? Let me state that another way, and that is it slows the reading down. You see that? There's no force or energy to it, right? And there's a reason for that. Here's where we have to identify why it has no force, why it has no energy, okay? go through this line by line. Let's do this quickly. I'm going to keep my eye on the timer because I have one more handout for you where we're going to talk about the three monsters and what we can learn from Beowulf's battle. Okay? But let's look at this. Beowulf is an old English poem that relates the story of three epic battles. I, I can live with that first sentence. Agree? Would you agree with me? Okay. I, I, I couldn't think of any way to mess that sentence up. Okay? I tried to. I tried to, to write that academically, but that would just okay, we're stuck with that one. Okay? So let's look at the second sentence and see if we can improve this one. First, the killing of a monster, Grendel, was initiated by Beowulf. And I think that was the point that you made. How, else, how can we say that simply? Beowulf killed the monster. Wow, but that's so simple. But notice what you've done. You've reduced the words. Okay, what is the subject? Can I ask you a grammatical question of that? Are you being offended? Okay. We hate grammar, right? Most people do. But grammar is important. What is the subject of the sentence that I wrote here? First, the killing of a monster, Grendel, was initiated by Beowulf. What is the subject? Killing. killing is the subject. But who should be the subject? What should be the subject? Who's doing, think of the action. The action is killing. Who's doing the killing? Beowulf. This is how you have to think, right? So the academic way of writing is to take all of the life and the force out of it, right? such that the people who are doing the action aren't doing the action anymore. And it's not Beowulf killing, it's the killing of Grendel by Beowulf. And you see how that happens? We've got to, that is classic academic textbook writing. Uh, we could get, if we had time, we could get into the complexities of, of why that's the case. This is called writing in the passive voice, if you're familiar with what that means. It's not necessary that you need to know what that is. 
but the passive voice rather than the active voice. The active voice is where people who are truly doing the action, they're the ones who are doing the verbs. They're doing the action. If Beowulf, if somebody's getting killed, who's doing the killing? Beowulf's killing Grendel, say it that way. Okay? And that's really, so what we're doing now is we're identifying why it sounded the way it did. Why it didn't work as academic writing. Let's keep reading. Having heard of the terrorizing by Grendel of the Danes, well, you better do something with that, okay? Beowulf undertook a long peregrination across the ocean with the intention of bringing assistance to King Hrothgar. I would say that's the single worst sentence I wrote in that paragraph. Right there. That is in need of major, major overhaul. Anybody have an idea? Quickly. Having heard of the terrorizing by Grendel of the Danes. Sounds like Grendel is from the Danes. Okay, well, so maybe it's, maybe it's confusing there. Yeah, yeah. He's going to Denmark, so that's where that's where uh, you know Grendel is killing the Danes. How about something like Beowulf heard of Grendel's terror or something like that, right? Okay, make it more active. And then we have Beowulf undertook a long peregrination across the ocean and journeyed across the sea, across the ocean, with the intention of bringing assistance to King Hrothgar. To assist, to help King Hrothgar, yeah. You notice how we turned a noun, assistance, into a verb. You see that? With the intention of, forget that, who needs with the intention of, right? So a lot of these phrases, you can just take them out. They're not pulling their weight, right? So he journeyed to help King Hrothgar, to assist King Hrothgar. Let's do a couple more. The defeat of Grendel, you should know by now what you need to do. The defeat of Grendel occurs in the meat hall at night and happens when its arm is torn off by Beowulf in combat. A horrible, gory, bloody scene. And then he hangs the arm of Grendel up above the, you know, the, the, the door of the meat hall wonderful scene, but uh, you wouldn't get any of that sense from the way I wrote it, would you? So how would you rewrite that? I would make, who's the hero here? Beowulf. Beowulf. Yeah, so let Beowulf be doing the action, right? Beowulf defeated Grendel in the Mead Hall at night and tore its arm off in battle. Yeah, exactly right. You see how, does everybody see how that's better? More direct. Do you also see how it's better, why it's better, how we're doing it? You're taking these dead nouns, these roundabout nouns that bury the action, and you're making the person who's really the hero of that sentence do the action of the sentence. Be thinking that way as you write, okay? Uh, we're almost done with this paragraph, and then I have one more handout for you, so let's keep going here. Next, we want to get rid of the first, next, and all that kind of stuff too, don't we? Right? It's not necessary. It sounds like an academic paper. The Danes are in, we could say something like, in revenge, Grendel's mother attacks the Danes. Is that better? Okay. Per Beowulf pursues her into her underwater lair. Pursues uh, her and kills her in her underwater lair. Something like that. More direct? More force? More energy? Absolutely. Easier to read. Easier to read. Makes you almost want to read it, right? Okay. Finally, a last battle is fought between Beowulf and a dragon. Is fought between Beowulf and a dragon. Can anybody change that for me? A last battle is fought. Was. No, I don't think is and was is going to change it too much there. Beowulf fights oh, last battle. Let's make him the hero again, right? Make Beowulf the hero of the sentence. So, Beowulf fought a final battle against a dragon. Is that better? against a dragon protecting treasure in a cave, or something like that, right? Having become an old man and needing the help of a younger warrior, Beowulf nevertheless manages to defeat the dragon before expiring in the battle. Ah, where do you begin with a sentence that bad? Any ideas? <laughs> needing to. Boy, sometimes you have to start right from the very beginning and just throw everything out, right? If you've got the idea of the sentence, don't feel like you've got to keep with the structure of it. Let's get rid of that whole having become an old man and just say, Beowulf is now an old man. 
and he needed uh, the help of the younger warrior. And the younger warrior needed the help, or something like that, right? But Beowulf is now a young man. With the help of a younger warrior, he manages, he, he defeats the dragon and dies in the battle. Expiring. Nobody mentioned that word before, right? You can throw that in there with peregrinations and subaqueous, right? If he died, just say he died, okay? So we have a better sentence now, right? The hero is the hero of the sentence. Okay. Let's finish it up. The telling of the story of Beowulf. Would you say that's wordy? The telling of the story of Beowulf. I think so. Beowulf's story. Or the story of Beowulf. That's fine too, right? And his three epic battles was common in England a thousand years ago, and it remains a popular story to this day. And I think we could probably live with the rest of that. Did we approve it? Oh, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It's just a kind of a group editing here. But notice how we started. We started with you registering how you felt about the writing. I want, to, I want to stress that point. Learn to listen to yourself. Listen to your ear. Learn to ask you. You might say, well, I don't know anything about grammar. OK. You, did, you didn't have to know anything about grammar to realize it was cold, unreadable, boring, terrible reading, right? You can, you can respond to it that way. The next step is to say, why is it like that? And that's what we did when we went through. Once you figure out why it's like that, then you do the third thing, which is what? Fix it. Fix it, right? So respond to it, diagnose it, and then fix it. But develop the ability to do that with your own writing. All right, got one more handout here. We'll go through this in a flash here. Two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, and five. Make sure that everybody has signed in on that sheet as well, if you don't mind. The writer as hero, again, that's the title of the presentation today. The writer as hero, overcoming the monsters of academic writing. I think we've already made good progress in illustrating a way of thinking about writing. Not feel bound by those monsters, right? But I'm going to now take these three battles, and I'm just going to give you some principles here that you can build on, that you can reflect on, that you can think about. I'm giving them to you in the form of a challenge a challenge for you to continue thinking about your own writing in light of these principles and start cultivating these principles as you write. Whatever it is you write, academic or not, whatever you write, think about these principles. Let's take monster number one, Grendel. Key principle that I really want to emphasize here from this story is that principle, do whatever works as a writer, do whatever works. You know, we tend to, academic writing is produced and the kind of writing we just read is produced not by thinking, I'm going to do what works. Instead, what produced this kind of writing was me thinking, I'm going to write a certain way, conformity with certain rules and certain expectations. That's what produced that writing. As opposed to, I've got a really exciting story and I want to do what works. I'm telling that story. It's a different way of thinking. Okay. Most of the time, when we labor under the burden of what I'm calling textbook academic writing, what we're doing is, we're, as I said at the outset of our session today, we're trying to remember all of those do's and don'ts, all of those rules that were handed to us, right? Can you quickly give me some of those do's and don'ts? Don't no. use the first person I. That's, that's one of my pet peeves, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, right? Don't use the first person I, right? Pretend that you don't exist, right? Other things. What are some other things that you're told to do and not do? Don't start a, a sentence off with a question. Don't start with a question, maybe, or a paper with a question. What else? Personal pronouns in general. Yeah, just handling personal pronouns. Don't say you when you're talking to the reader, right? That might offend them. That's way too informal, right? Or don't say we. And all, all those are rules you know, that we've been taught in one form or the other. Many of them are basically pet peeves. Right? But you have to play according to the rules that are given you sometimes. There's no question about that, right? Especially when your paper's getting graded. I'm trying to teach you, though, a different way of thinking about writing so you can break out, break out of that mold, right? All right, so here's the idea. Why do I say that Grendel illustrates his point of doing whatever works? Beowulf lived off in, in a different place, and he, he, heard about, he heard about this monster. 
and he traveled to that place. And he went to that hall, that mead hall, it's a beer hall is what it is, in, in old Anglo, Anglo-Saxon times, right? Where uh, the king was there, King Hrothgar, and every night Grendel came and killed people in that mead hall, okay? Here's the idea I want you to get. Beowulf came from outside with a different way of thinking. Have you noticed that sometimes that people, when they come from a different place, or they come from outside your group or something, right, or they join your group or your organization or whatever, and they bring a different way of thinking. They have different experience. They have different beliefs or values or whatever, and, and, and they, they, they add something, right? They give you a different perspective. I want you to think about Beowulf that way. You know what? They weren't having a lot of luck dealing with Grendel. Would you agree? They were getting killed every night. You know, every night they lost one more soldier who did not know how to slay the monster. Along comes Beowulf from the outside with a fresh way of thinking. He said, you know what? You guys are using the same old rules over and over again, and they're not working very well. Let's do what works. And he is a great hero. He knew how to do that. And that rip in the arm off of Grendel and fierce arm to arm, hand to hand, hand combat. And that's what he did. But whatever it took, he was willing to do. Use, here's my point. Look at the sub points. Be ready to break the rules if you want to kill the monster. Well, don't quote me and say in the next class you're in, well, Dr. Babcock said that I, I didn't have to follow your rules. No, follow whatever rules or whatever class you're in, okay? Again, you understand the point I'm making, right? If you want to become a better writer, you've got to understand that the rules sometimes have to be broken, right? Second point, empower yourself with options. I love this statement. Empower yourself with options. Don't limit yourself. That frees you when you think that way, right? And then thirdly, effectiveness is the most important rule. Effectiveness is all about what works. Do what works. You're told not to write fragments, right? Don't write sentence fragments. Well, guess what? I teach my students this, and I give them examples, and I'm going to give you one right here. The best writers, you know what they do? The best writers, they use fragments. Why? Because they do what works. If it's effective, if it's effective to make a point, use a fragment. If it's effective to start, and nobody mentioned this a minute ago, to start a sentence with a hand, or to start a sentence with but, if it's effective to do that, guess what? The best writers do it. If it works, if it's the right thing to do. Now, if your teacher says don't do that, then be smart, right? But again, I'm teaching you a new way of thinking about writing. And there'll be many contexts which you can exercise your writing free from those kinds of arbitrary rules and to develop yourself into the writing, writer that you have the potential to be. Let's look quickly at this example. This, some of you may recognize this from my classes. Uh, I, I like to use the, some short essays at the beginning of the semester. This is the one on refrigerator magnets. But I want you to look at some of the rules, supposedly, that are broken here. Yet it's a wonderful, vivid, effective paragraph. It was a beautiful, actually, this isn't on refrigerator magnets. This is on a football play, OK, a football play. It was a beautiful feat. A dazzling one. Some called it poetic. And although it has been heralded as a one-of-a-kind catch, it joins a list of other one-of-a-kind catches in all-time great plays collected on highlight reels. But besides ooing and awing over such moments, what more is there to say? Well, that's just a small section from that. But I think you'd agree with me that's vividly written. It's dramatically written. It flows wonderfully. It's very direct and economical. It doesn't use words unnecessarily, and it breaks all the rules. How about that, right? Let's look at some of the rules that are broken. Do we have any fragments here? Yeah, it was a beautiful feat, a dazzling one. That's a fragment. But this writer knows what he's doing. And that's OK. The best writers do that. He's, he's deliberately writing that fragment because it's effective. It draws the point. It puts the spotlight. It emphasizes the fact, right? And any other way that he had written it, would have written it, would have made it less effective. Other rules that he breaks, he starts a sentence with and. Why? Because it gives it forward energy and motion, doesn't it? Similarly, the word but. And so do what works when you write. Don't be bound by arbitrary rules and just mindlessly apply rules. When you were a kid, did you ever ask why? when you were told to do something. Do this, don't do this. Did you ever say why? OK, well, I know I didn't. I know my kids asked me that growing up lots of times, right? 
And it's never really a very good answer, but parents always say that because I said so. <laughs> parents always do that, right? Kids have, I think, a right to know why. And it's a good question, right? If there's no point to the point other than because I said so, a kid's going to figure that out pretty quickly, right? Same thing with writing. You might say, oh, I'm never supposed to start a sentence with and, and what? But why? There you go, right? Sometimes it works to do that. Let's move on to the second monster. Do you have any questions on that or comments on that? We're going to move here kind of quickly to finish up the rest of Beowulf's fights. The second monster is Grendel's mother, and she's even, she's even worse than Grendel. Okay? I mean, you get mom upset. Right? Get, get, you, you know what they say about a mother bear, for example, right? That's kind of what you're dealing with here with, with Grendel's mom. So she comes seeking revenge. This time, I want you to notice, Beowulf leaves the beer hall, and he pursues her into the wilderness. She goes down into this subaqueous lair. We know what that was, right? Underwater lair. She goes down in, and what does Beowulf do? He doesn't say, oh, I can't go there. That's too private, that's too personal, that's too subjective, that's too, that's her private space. No. He goes down into that place where nobody else goes, and that's where we see the hero. We see the hero in that personal hand-to-hand -hand battle with Grendel's mother. The point I want you to see is that this, when I say use your own sword as the key principle, this makes me think of good writers Good writers, they are not afraid of developing their own personal voice, their own subjectivity, their own personal experience of who they are. I see that with Beowulf. It's only Beowulf. He has nobody else with him. This is his journey. This is his challenge. This is his adventure. This is his life and death struggle. It's just him and Grendel's mom. Nobody else is there. It's his story. It's his paper. Put it another way, right? Every paper that you write, it's your paper. It's you. It's not somebody else. It's you. It's your voice. It's your words. You're the one going down into that underwater lair to battle with your topic, to try to get victory over it, right? Whatever that victory is going to look like. It's chopping Gretel's mom's head off and so be it, right? Whatever the victory looks like, it's your victory. It's your battle. It's your paper. It's your don't be afraid of your voice. Don't be afraid of developing your own style. You've got to, you see how you've got to learn how to hear your voice, right? And hear your style. And start to recognize what makes up your style. And then cultivate that and develop that. I'm getting all that just from that image of this solo journey, this adventure, right? That Beowulf makes. It's a battle. He's not doing this now in front of everybody where they're telling him, do this, do that. No, he's the one who's got to do it himself. It's going to be his battle. He's going to do it his way, and he's going to use it. He's going to use his sword. That's why the principle I'm giving you is use your own sword. Use your, you know what? Your own sword is always your best weapon, right? Your voice is always your best voice when you write, not somebody else's voice. I can't write in somebody else's voice. I told you how hard it was for me to write that. I was trying to write in somebody else's voice. Right? As opposed to writing it naturally that I've cultivated over the years of my own style and my own voice. Right? So your weapon, your sword is the best one to use in every encounter, in every fight that you have. Look at the points that I make here underneath this. <clears throat> Beowulf had to follow his instincts. She jumped into that underwater, into that underwater lair and he went right after her. And it was dangerous, but he followed his instincts. And, and what a great example that is, right? Using his sword in his hand. His sword had to have a sharp edge. Wouldn't you agree with me? He's not taking a dull sword with him. It's a sharp sword. How does a, how does a sword get sharp? Over time, through experience, when you use it, you sharpen it, the discipline, right? Do you have to do that with writing? And cultivating your own voice, your own style, that, does it take time to do that? Does it take a lot? He probably used the sword in a lot of battles, I'm guessing, right? He probably spent a lot of time, discipline, working the craft of that sword, right? You have to do that with writing, too. To get 
get your own voice, to hear your own voice, to know how to develop that, you've got to sharpen your sword. Okay, so don't be afraid of that process. It will take time, but it will come when you do that. There's another term that's used to describe the way a sword or a, a knife feels in your hand. The term is heft, if you're familiar with that term. And that, that, that's the weight, the weight of the sword in your hand. It has a certain heft to it. Your own sword is going to feel a little different in your hand. Now, my style wouldn't be right for you. It feels good. It has a good heft in my hand. So think about that metaphor and start thinking about what your style, what your voice is, what your sword is when you fight the battle of academic writing. Well, the example is also one of these short essays. This is about refrigerator magnets. Refrigerator mag magnets are uh, small, cheap, durable, colorful, and come in a limitless variety of shapes and sizes. Now, that could be a rather boring initial sentence. There's a lot of detail there, which I like. But that could be kind of a, uh, a yawning sort of a sentence. But then notice what happens. All of these qualities make them incredibly easy to hoard. Now, suddenly I'm interested. <laughs> the idea of hoarding refrigerator magnets seems kind of almost discouraging. Thanks to this interesting. Thanks to our incredibly large refrigerators, Americans have ample space to display even the biggest collections. I want you to see how he brings himself into this, his own subjectivity. This is what I, remember you said, don't use I. Okay? How on earth can you write and express who you are and what you think and what you believe without saying I? Because that's how we refer to ourselves, right? He goes on and says, art museums drove me into the ranks of refrigerator magnet orders. I used to buy postcards and paintings that I liked, but most of them sat in the desk drawer. Because magnets are smaller than postcards, I can now fit more art under the fridge, and there's still room for a magnetic message. Well, do you have a sense that you know who this person is? Just a little bit? His personality? His style? Yeah, I think so. Because he's opened up a window onto his quirky interests and hobbies. We see him. His sword is different from my sword. His personality and his style are different from mine. Let's finish with the last point. There's one more dragon. Fifty years later, Beowulf's a king now. He's got to fight one more battle. This time there's a dragon terrorizing the countryside and uh, guarding this enormous horde of treasure in the cave. And that's, what, that's what dragons do. We know that, right? They sit. You know, on a hoard of treasure that they've looted, and they're not going to give it up to anybody until a hero comes along and decides to take it. The image I want to get, I want you to see and to get from this, is that you have something to say when you write. You have something important to say, or why are you writing? And what you want to say, what you need to say, what you need, that's your treasure. That's your treasure. Don't stop until you get that treasure. Don't stop until you seize it, you take it kill that dragon to take that treasure, but make sure that your meaning isn't lost. Make sure that what you want to say isn't hidden in a cave guarded by an ugly old dragon. Take back your meaning. That's what Beowulf, the writer is hero, that's what he does. He goes and he fights that dragon. Don't, in other words, what I'm saying is don't hide what you want to say. We do that. Academic writing does that. Think of all the ways that academic textbooks and writing hides what they want to say. They bury it. They bury it under things that we call jargon, terminology, words like, oh, peregrination and subaqueous and expiring, right? Burying the meaning. And some ugly old dragon is guarding and protecting that. And I need to take the meaning back. And that's what, with his sword in hand, one more time, that's what old Beowulf does. There's another point I want you to see. Write with passion and conviction, because taking that meaning back is your meaning. It's what you want to say. Don't let anybody else take that from you, right? So take that back. Do that with passion and do it with conviction. He fights that battle even though he dies. In the I'm not saying we're going to die when we write papers. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But it's a picture of commitment and passion. You might feel like you're going to die sometimes, right? Okay. But uh, nonetheless, the point that I'm drawing from the, from the example of Beowulf, the point I'm drawing from Beowulf is that he has enough passion that you know he's willing to do that because it's important enough. It's important enough to take that treasure back, right? I love Annie Dillard is a wonderful writer. She was a Pulitzer Prize is a wonderful writer, Pulitzer Prize winning writer. 
she um, did her uh, writing her undergraduate work over at um, Holland's College, over at Holland University, over in Roanoke. Um, as I said, one of the Pulitzer Prize considered one of the, the leading American uh, writers of this generation, of her generation. Um, and she teaches writing. And I love that I took this sentence out of, of an essay she wrote called The Death of a Moth. Because it's basically about writing with conviction and passion. She's telling her writing students the following. How many of you, I asked the people in my class, which of you want to give your lives and be writers? You must go at your life with a broad axe. Well, if you can picture a broad axe, it's something like a Viking's going to have. It's something like Beowulf's going to have, right? Go at your life. It's going to be, could be painful, could be dangerous, but bring passion and if you really want to break out of the stifling mold of writing in a way that's not you, in a way that can never be you. And if you have something to say, then by all means defend that. And fight for that. Take that treasure back and say it with your sword, not somebody else's, with your sword in hand. And those are three things that Beowulf, I think, can teach us when we consider the hero as the writer. Well, do you have any questions or any comments uh, or any input on that? I'm really happy that you guys came out today. I hope it was productive for you. I hope it was inspiring at least, right? Yeah. That, uh, to, and that's really what I wanted to do is just to kind of, as I said, give you kind of a pep talk, but some things to think about that you can build upon and continue to reflect upon as you develop your own abilities as writers. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you.